Female soccer players cover total distances ranging between 9 to 11.5 kilometers, and between 344 and 867 meters are travelled at high speed running, which is speed ranging from 19.8 to 25 kilometers per hour, and between 69 to 274 meters are covered by sprinting, classified as speed above 25.2 kilometers an hour. These physical demands are affected by playing position, with central midfielders covering the most distance. The importance of linear sprinting is also highlighted by the fact it's the most frequent locomotive action in goal situations, performed by both the scoring and assisting players. Within the female professional game, every four seconds, sprinting, jumping and change of direction activities are performed, indicating that these high intensity efforts may occur more than a thousand times per match. And players who have a high relative strength have greater sprint, change of direction and jump performance compared to their weaker counterparts. To be able to repeatedly perform and recover from these high intensity efforts, aerobic fitness is essential. The average oxygen consumption in professional matches is between 77 and 80% of VO2 max, peaking at 96%. Therefore, possessing a combination of both aerobic capacity and repeated sprint ability allows a player to perform greater successive high-intensity movement with short rest intervals. The article, published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, titled Rationale and Practical Recommendations for Testing Protocols in Female Soccer, by Marco and colleagues, in their narrative review, aimed to evaluate the literature regarding aerobic tests, linear and repeated sprint ability tests, change of direction tests, strength tests and jump tests, and anthropometric assessments, which can be used to help inform training program design and oversee player development. This presentation, brought to you by Talking Sports Science, will be a summary of their recommendations. The gold standard method of assessment of aerobic capacity is an incremental lab-based treadmill VO2 max protocol lasting between 10 to 15 minutes. However, due to equipment cost, lab time and expertise required to run the test, field tests are more widely used. The two of the most common field tests include the yo-yo intermittent test, level 1 and 2, and the 30-15 intermittent fitness test. The yo-yo intermittent tests comprise of 2 times 20 meter shuttle runs, followed by an active recovery period. Players begin the test from cone B, and when instructed by the audio player, must run towards cone C, which must be reached before the following beak signal, and immediately return to cone B before the next signal. Once cone B is reached, players have a 10 second recovery period in which they must jog from cone B towards cone A, and then back to cone B before the start of the next shuttle. If a player fails to reach cone C and back to cone B in the allocated time, one fail is issued. If this happens a second consecutive time, then they are eliminated and total distance is recorded. In terms of reliability, the coefficient of variation is often used as an index of reliability, with a lower score indicating less variability in the data and so a more reliable test measurement. In a group of elite female soccer players, the coefficient of variation for level 1 was 7.2%, and for level 2 was 4.2% in a sample of Premier League Academy players. Regarding the 30-15 intermittent fitness test, this comprises of 30 seconds of continuous shuttle running, interspersed with 15 seconds walking recovery periods. The athletes are required to run back and forth between the two lines, i.e. cone A and C, set 40 metres apart, at a speed governed by the audio beep. The first 30 second shuttle run is at 8 km an hour and this speed increases by 0.5 km per hour for every 30 second stage thereafter. The two 3 meter zones in the middle of the testing area, i.e. zone B, exist so that the athletes can gauge the required running speed and therefore can adjust their speed accordingly. Similarly, the two 3 meter end zones also help guide the athlete to maintain the appropriate speed. During the 15 second recovery period, 
athletes are required to walk in a forward direction towards the closest 3 meter zone in the required time. This zone is where they will start the next running stage from. Failure to reach the next 3 meter zone on three consecutive occasions results in elimination from the test. The speed of the last stage completed is recorded as their test score. The coefficient of variation was found to be 1.8% in a sample of 17 well-trained female soccer players. Scores for both the yo-yo intermittent and the 30-15 intermittent fitness test appear to differentiate between age groups and female players of different levels. When interested in assessing the average sprint time, sprint tests ranging from between 5 to 30 metres using timing gates can be used, as this is the typical sprint distance during a match. However, distances between 10 to 30 metres are recommended, as the reliability for 5 metre tests can be questionable. When the aim is to assess higher sprint velocities and peak speeds, longer distances, for example 40 metres, are recommended, and because timing gates cannot measure peak speeds, global navigation satellite system technology would be needed. To facilitate reaching peak speed, players could start their test in motion, for example using a flying sprint test protocol, i.e. a 10 metre acceleration plus a 30 metre sprint. Assessment of peak speed not only provides information on the linear sprinting capacity, but also allows sprinting thresholds to be individualised based on the peak speed recorded in the test. When analysing match and training performance, the sprinting threshold is commonly set at distance covered over 25.2 km per hour for all players independent of their peak speed. This could potentially underestimate or overestimate the actual load of each player. Therefore, the use of peak speed to individualise sprinting thresholds is recommended to help avoid this issue. When aiming to assess repeat sprint ability, the protocol recommended is a 20 plus 20 meter shuttle with a 180 degree change of direction, followed by a 20 second period of passive recovery after each shuttle, which is repeated six times. Test parameters include best RSA time, mean RSA time and RSA decrement which have a coefficient variation of 1.3%, 0.8% and 30.2% respectively. During games, players need to regularly perform rapid changes of direction to evade defenders in attack as well as respond to an opponent's movement. Therefore, it's no surprise that change of direction can discriminate players of different playing standards and is important for the progression from youth to senior players. In terms of assessment of change of direction ability, there is no gold standard test. However, the 505 test and the Illinois test are recommended as they both are valid and reliable. Alongside the change of direction score, it's important to be aware of the other physical components the test is potentially assessing, such as linear sprinting and physiological factors when repeated change of direction actions are performed. A measure that can be added to existing change of direction tests is the change of direction deficit. For example, the change of direction deficit calculated from the 505 provides a measure of the time required to add one 180 degree change of direction to a 10 meter sprint. Basically, the larger the deficit, the less effective the direction change, or the lower the ability of an athlete to change direction relative to their physical capability for linear speed. When conducting change of direction tests, make sure the floor surface and other environmental factors are kept consistent. Moving on to strength, which is correlated with sprinting, jumping and change of direction. Therefore, impacting actions such as running through on goal to shoot, jumping for a header or save, and even turning a player to evade or tackle them. Consequently, muscle strength testing protocols, both absolute and relative to a person's body weight, play an important role in the design of an individualised training programme. Common strength assessments include 1RM testing, for example the back squat, isometric testing, for example isometric mid-thigh pull, 
eccentric contraction testing, for example using the Nord board, and isokinetic dynamometry, which is considered the gold standard and can be used to evaluate concentric and eccentric strength. These tests are reported to have an excellent level of test-retest reliability and an acceptable level of technical error of measurement, around 4-5%. to Lower limb power is a prerequisite of speed and agility and can be assessed using jump tests. The broad jump is an example of a horizontal jump test. And common vertical jump tests include the counter movement jump and drop jump, which both utilise the stretch shortening cycle, which involves a high intensity eccentric contraction immediately prior to a rapid concentric contraction. And the squat jump is another vertical jump test that assesses the capability to rapidly develop force solely during a concentric movement. Counter movement jumps with hands placed on the hips performed on a force platform has been suggested to be the most valid and reliable for isolated lower limb power. However, not everyone has access to force platforms. Alternatively, there's a range of field-based testing equipment that can be used at lower cost, such as jump mats, video assessment, mobile apps, for example, the MyJump Lab, and accelerometers and linear encoders to estimate a force velocity curve. It's important to use the same protocol and same assessment tools so changes over the time can be accurately monitored without adding possible confounding factors. Assessment of body composition provides a broad measure of fitness. A favourable anthropometric profile is viewed as having low levels of fat mass along with high levels of fat free mass. Several indirect tests are currently available for assessing body composition, with DEXA being the most valid and reliable method, although it's not without legal and ethical constraints due to the small dose of radiation that is emitted. Doubly indirect methods are also available and include bioelectrical impedance, 3D photonic scanning and estimations for body fat percentage from ultrasound and skin fold thickness measures. These methods use predictive regression equations and so have a greater error compared to DEXA. For ecological reasons, the Isaac sum of eight measures collected by the same practitioner is recommended for the best compromise. The use of anthropometric assessment provides limited health information, and a desire to maintain a low body mass or body fat percentage may lead to a calorie restriction, and in doing so can impair bone health and lead to suboptimal menstrual function. Therefore, caution should be taken when obtaining and translating results from anthropometric assessments. And that concludes this presentation. As always, go and check out the full article. The link is in the description. Thanks for listening, folks. See you next time.